Well, welcome to session two of The Mystery of Babylon, an alternative viewpoint. And uh, this time, having talked about the history and the origin in the past, we're now going to talk about its prophetic destiny. Does it have a role in your life and mine? And that role may be closer at hand than we have any idea. And so the Bible, of course, deals with, is in a sense, a tale of two cities. The uh, Jerusalem, the city of God, uh, which is climaxed by the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven, and Babylon, the city of man, or some people would call it the city of Satan. It represents all that God abhors. The origin of all false worship turns out to have its roots planted in this city. So Babylon is mentioned over 300 times in the Bible. That should get our attention. It's alluded to three times in Christ's genealogy, the sacred messianic family tree. The name Babylon shows up three times. And of course, it was the capital of the first world dictator. And we suspect it's going to be the capital of the last world dictator. And uh, so now I want one of the things we want to really get across, and that's why we spent so much time in the first session getting into the history, is not to confuse the fall of Babylon, which occurred in 539 BC when Babylon was taken over by the Persians, with the doom of Babylon described in the Bible. The fall of Babylon is, the emphasis here is that it happened without a battle. Ugbaru, uh, uh, Cyrus's general, just by clever strategies, took it over. It became the capital, not a secondary capital of the Persians, but even 200 years later when Alexander conquers the Persians, it becomes his capital. It was not destroyed when it fell to the Persians. And uh, it atrophied. After Alexander's death, it atrophied over the centuries, but there were still people living there, building and doing things, uh, small groups, uh, as late as the 19th century. But the main point is, it is presently being rebuilt. Saddam Hussein spent over 20 years and 60 million bricks, by some estimates, putting it back on the map. Now, the reason this becomes so important to understand is because the Bible spends a lot of its time on the doom of Babylon in Isaiah 13 and 14 and Jeremiah 50 and 51 in particular. We'll look at some other places too. We're going to look at that briefly and we'll discover that it emphasizes that it will, after it's destroyed, it'll never again be inhabited. The building materials will never be reused. In fact, both Isaiah and Jeremiah emphasize it's going to be destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah, that is suddenly, catastrophically, very quickly. That has never happened in history. Nothing has happened that even comes close to those, uh, th that uh, prognostication. So that means to someone that takes the Bible seriously, Babylon has yet to rise to power again to receive the judgment that is decreed by God in his word. And then there, to complicate this a little further, Book of Revelation has two chapters on mystery Babylon. Is that the Babylon on the Euphrates? Is that some other allegory? There are a lot of views floating around. We'll take a quick look at that too. Let's take a look at Isaiah 13. And we won't look at it all, but let's just get the flavor of it here. The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see, lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain, exalt the voice unto them, and shake the hand that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for mine anchor, even them that rejoice in my highness. The noise of the multitude of the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustered the host of the battle. Notice this phrase. Obviously, the whole chapter, chapter 13 and 14, is all about the, the destruction of Babylon. Notice that it's not a particular nation like the Persians or the Greeks or whatever. Kingdoms, plural, of nations gathered together. This is a global thing going on here. And he goes on, he says, They come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the, even the Lord, and the weapons of his indignation, to what? To destroy the whole land. That's never happened. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. Here's this phrase that Joel and other prophets use to speak of this final climactic period that we regard as being intensified from, from Revelation 6 through 19. How will ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. They shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed at one another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord coming, verse 9, 
cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Notice something else here. This goes far beyond any normal tactical description. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Heavy stuff coming down. I'll punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place. You know, I have seen studies of nuclear weapons that if you take enough very large nuclear weapons and detonate them at the same time, you'll change the orbit of the earth. And uh, that seems to be what's suggested here. In the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger, and it shall be as the chaste roe and the sheep that no man taketh up, and shall every man turn to his own people and flee every one into his own land. And it goes on, but that verse 17 is interesting. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them, which shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Now, because there's a reference to the Medes in this passage, many people jump to the conclusion that this is portraying when the Persians and the Medes took over Babylon, except the description no way fits. Just because they're mentioned doesn't mean they, it still can't be future. In fact, the Medes are known today, I believe, as the Kurds. And you may recall that Saddam Hussein used uh, poison gas and so forth on his own people, on, on, the, on the Kurdish population. Gas attacks in 1987 and 88. So the hatred of the Kurds or the Medes against Iraqis in general is intense. The Kurds are a strange people. They dominate uh, southeastern Turkey, north uh, western Iraq, uh, uh, Iran, and northern Iraq. They're, that region there, it's, they're, they're a people without a country. But uh, they are uh, apparently principles. Uh, they're going to be stirred up against this. And it, it, it doesn't take much imagination today to see them stirred up. That's one of the main problems there in, uh, in the region. And their bows shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity in the fruit of their mouth. I shall not spare the children. And Babylon, get this, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency. I don't think this, this is an idiom for Rome or New York or Paris. It's the Chaldean excellency. The, the, the beauty it shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Isaiah and Jeremiah both use this phrase. How was Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed? Suddenly, catastrophically. That's what's, what's in view here. And uh, it shall never be inhabited. Neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there. Neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. The term Arabian is, shouldn't take for granted. This is nowhere near Arabia. Why would there be Arabians there? You can think that one through yourself. But anyway, it shall never be inhabited is the key emphasis here. It is inhabited today. So this has not happened yet. This is yet future. And the beasts of the, uh, the desert shall lie there. Their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. The owl shall dwell there and satyrs shall dance there. In the Hebrew, these terms are not animals. They're also used of demons. Same terms are used. The wild beasts of the island shall cry in their desolate houses and dragons in their pleasant places, and her time is near to come, and her days shall not be prolonged. So much for Isaiah 13. Let's pick a few things from Isaiah 14. Verse 1, the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and yet choose Israel and set them in their own land. Boy, that's interesting. This could not have happened before 1948. They weren't in their own land. And the strangers shall be joined with them, indeed, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for the servants and handmaids, and they shall take them captives, whose captives they were, shall rule over their oppressors, and so forth. Then we get down near the end of the show. In the middle of this chapter, there's a lot of other things, very important stuff. You want to read the origin of Lucifer and so forth. is alluded and in, incidental to all this. But as it gets near the end of the chapter, it says, Rejoice not, thou whole Palestina. I'm fascinated with this term. Don't jump to, don't let that pass without notice. Because it was called Palestine by the Romans, where they deliberately named the land after their enemies, the Philistines. That's what has called it Palestine. Every time you use the word Palestine, using the language of their enemies. That was a term used by the Romans and emphasized by the British under the mandate, and is called that today by the adversaries. It's interesting that this is here prophetically. It wasn't called Palestine back then. Whole Palestina. 
Rejoice not thou whole Palestine. I don't see it partitioned here either. That's interesting. Because of the root of him who smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be the fiery flying serpent. The fr and so, howl ye, O gate, How cry, O city, thou whole Palestine. There it is again. Art dissolved, for there shall come from the north a smoke, and none shall be alone in his appointed times. And who shall, and what, sh what shall one then answer the messenger of the nation, that the Lord hath founded Zion, and the poor of his people shall trust in it, and so forth. Let's move to Jeremiah. They're very long chapters, so I'll just pick up a few verses out of it to give you the flavor. But it's important. What I encourage all of you to do is sit down and read four, six chapters at one sitting. Isaiah 13 and 14 that we've excerpted. Jeremiah 15 and 51 that we'll also just glance at a few verses. And Revelation 17 and 18. Read all six chapters at one sitting because I want the language to be fresh in your mind. It's a very important exercise for you to go through. You'll see why in a minute. Jeremiah 50 opens up, the word of the Lord spake against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans. This is not Rome, it's not Paris, it's not New York or Hollywood or whatever. You hear all kinds of interesting conjectures. Babylon as a metaphor can be used all kinds of ways, but the, this is talking about Babylon, uh, the land of Chaldeans. Declare ye among the nations and publish and set up a standard, publish and conceal it not. Say, Babylon is taken, Bel is confessor God, Bel is confounded, Merodach is broken in pieces. Uh, her idols are confounded, her images are broken in pieces. Now skip down, it says, in those days and at that time, saith the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, they and the children of Judah together going and weeping, they shall go and seek the Lord their God. That's kind of interesting. We got... Uh, Israel and Judah, north and south kingdoms. There's no lost tribes, by the way. They seem to have found each other by the time you get here. Um, I will raise and cause up against Babylon an assembly of great nations. See the plural again from the north country. And they set, should set themselves in array against her. From thence she shall be taken. Their arrows shall be as a mighty expert man. None shall return in vain. Now this is interesting. The word arrows there is the word ketz, which is an arrow, a dart, a javelin, or an engine of war. Um, shall be as of a mighty expert man. When you first read that, you assume that's talking about the archer, the guy shooting the arrows. No, that's not what it's saying. They shall be as of a mighty expert. The arrow is the comment, the clause is about the arrows. What are the arrows? They're as of a mighty expert man. The word is shakal. Uh, shakal, it's a, uh, it means wise or prudent, circumspect, with insight. The insight, the circumspection, the, the, the insight is not the guy shooting the arrow, it's in the arrow. That's astonishing to recognize. We're talking about smart weapons here. Caught them guided missiles, smart bombs. In case you miss that, the next phrase explains the result. None shall return in vain. These are smart weapons that can't miss. The, now, if you had read this, you know, say a decade ago or two decades ago, whatever, uh, it would, you could easily miss that. Today, if you remember the vivid, vivid footage of the precision w weapons that were used in Operation Iraqi Freedom, this really comes home to roost. The precision of weapons today is astonishing even to professional military. It's amazing what they can do. They, they can pick the window that the thing goes through. And uh, Skipping down to verse 13, because of the wrath of the Lord, it shall not be inhabited, but it shall be wholly desolate. See, again, this destruction is going to leave it uninhabitable. Not only does it kill everybody, people can't live there later. Think about that. Um, everyone that goeth by Babylon shall be astonished and hiss at her plagues. And uh, it goes on. We'll try to get, it's a long chapter, so I'll just get, excerpt a few things here. In those days and at that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none for the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I reserve. Wow! Israel's in the land and forgiven. Think about that. That's wild. And again, it emphasizes that the work of the Lord of hosts in the land of the Chaldeans in verse 25. See, again, this is, this is, on, this is in the plain of Shinar. This is in the Chaldeans. And in uh, verse 39 40, it shall be no more inhabited forever, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. And here Jeremiah used the same phrase again, as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighboring sinnings thereof and so forth. So shall no man abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell therein. And behold, a people shall come from the north and a great nation and many kings shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth. So this is global in its scope, clearly. Chapter 51, we won't just take a few from this one. 
in uh, verse 5, For Israel hath not been forsaken, nor Judah of his God, or of the Lord of hosts, though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. Interesting. Israel's forgiven on the one hand, but the land was filled with sin against who? The Holy One of Israel. Who could that possibly be? Yeah. And so... But there's some other phrases Jeremiah also indulges in. Verse 7, he says, Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. These, this idea of the nations being drunk is picked up in the book of Revelation. I want you to look to that right in front. Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. And of course, that chapter, verse 17, 18, Revelation, fallen, fallen, and so forth. And... Uh, so, I will render unto Babylon and to all the inhabitants of Chaldea all their evil that they have done in Zion in your, in your sight, saith the Lord. And uh, I am against the destroying mountain, saith the Lord, which destroyeth all the earth. I will stretch out my hand upon thee and roll thee down from the rocks and make thee a burnt mountain. And uh, they shall not take of thee a stone for a corner nor a stone for fountains, but thou shalt be desolate forever, saith the Lord. Has this happened yet? Not so you notice. Huh? A couple of these phrases intrigue me. I want to do some more study on them. It, 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 uh, it speaks of uh, it caused the horses to come up as the rough caterpillars. I wonder what that means. Would this be Jeremiah seeing what we call a tank tread? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it needs more study to, to, not to jump to conclusions, but I think it's interesting. And, and, the, and notice the Medes are mentioned to prepare against her the nations with the kings of the Medes and so on. They're also alluded to here. And uh, the land shall tremble in sorrow. Every purpose of the Lord shall be formed against, performed against Babylon to make the land of Babylon a desolation without an inhabitant. That's certainly not true today. And uh, the daughter of Babylon is like a thrashing floor. In the scripture, often the word thrashing floor is used idiomatically of the, of the tribulation. And we're always reminded of Ruth. At the thrashing floor scene, she's at the feet of Boaz. That's kind of fun. And so you can run with that if you like. Babylon shall become heaps, a dwelling place for dragons, an astonishment, and a hissing without an inhabitant. Whew. On it goes. How Shishak, by the way, is an Atbash translation of Babylon, by the way. But how is Shishak taken? How is the praise of the whole earth surprised? How has Babylon become an astonishment among the nations? From the context, many scholars recognize Shishak as an idiom for Babylon. They say it must have been a suburb or something. No, the ones that have done that haven't read the Talmud. Talmud explains this was Atbash of Babylon. If you transpose it according to Atbash, that's what you get. Anyway, but again, we're dealing with a very literal Babylon. Oh, and the sea has come up to Babylon. That's an interesting thing. Covered with the multitude of the waves thereof. That's a mystery unless you understand the possibilities of what may happen. For cities are a desolation, a dry land, a wilderness, a land wherein no man dwelleth. That's not true today. And so on. The doom of Babylon, the fall of Babylon without a battle, became, became a, sub, a, a capital over the centuries later. Atrophies, it's presently being rebuilt. The destruction of Babylon, we reviewed, is never to be inhabited. Building materials never used, like Sodom and Gomorrah. And we still have mystery Babylon to deal with. That's the book of Revelation. Let's take a quick look at that. If we look at these six chapters, Isaiah 13 and 14, Jeremiah 15 and 51, Revelation 17 and 18, they all make re reference to the fact there's many nations attacking. Israel is in the land and forgiven. It's going to be destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. Both Isaiah and Jeremiah emphasize that. Never to be inhabited. Bricks never be used. It's mentioned all through these passages. We've seen it many times. It happens during the day of the Lord. And it's literal Chaldean Babylon that we're talking about. But we're also going to, Jeremiah mentions, and Revelation is going to pick up, the idea that the kings are fornicating with her. Strange use of term. That they were drunk with wine. Jeremiah and, and uh, Revelation in both 17 and 18 make, emphasize that. And we see the scarlet, the purple, and the golden cup mentioned in Jeremiah and the book of Revelation. So let's take a quick look at Revelation 17. There came up one of the seven angels who had seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Here Babylon is portrayed in a feminine term as a prostitute. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Strange idioms to our ears, but that's the term that's used all through the Old Testament. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Wow. 
And he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, interesting, notice that the woman is not the beast. One of the things that Dave Hunt uh, used as his title for his, for his milestone study, called The Woman Rides the Beast, his study of this very pa these very passages. But the, don't confuse the woman, which is this idolatrous uh, uh, religious system that is going to take advantage and ride the beast. The beast will turn upon her before it's all over. The woman is arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. And having a golden cup in her hand. That's right out of Jeremiah 51. Full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Whew. And B Dave Hunt makes quite a case that you need to go through and study for yourself. That links this at least in part to the Vatican. Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great. The mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. All religious idolatry on the planet earth has its roots in Babylon. And uh, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. Wow. He, what religious system has been accountable for more saints being murdered or tortured to death than any other movement on the planet Earth? You will not understand the history of Europe unless you study it from the point of view of the struggle between the kings of Europe and the Vatican's quest for temporal power. The blood of the martyrs of the, the, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. That gets very specific, doesn't it? When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. You do need to understand, you need to go through the history of the popes, you'll discover one pope one afternoon murdered more Christians than all the Roman emperors put together. You need to go through those, some of those things to understand the background here. Not very pleasant for many people, and it offends many Catholics, but it's essential that you understand the history to un understand what the Bible's saying about it. He saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest, the, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. The waters are mentioned here. They're not water. Here it's used idiomatically of, of, of multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore. And they shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. In other words, she'll ride this for a while, but it'll turn on her. And that's part of what we're going to see destroyed here. That's chapter, a little more, 17. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give the, their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Present tense by John writing this. What city ruled over the kings of the earth when he wrote this? Rome. Rome. Let's go to Re Revelation 17. Oh, uh, the summary of 17. Um, notice... The prostitute's not the beast, but it rides the beast. The reference to the cup is, again, a link to Jeremiah. And the mystery of Babylon is a term used. It's not just literal Babylon. It's my, the mystery of Babylon is this false religious system that's been identified with the city of Rome from the early centuries of the Christian era until today. But actually, it goes far deeper than that, which we'll touch, by in a minute, touch on in a minute here. Let's go to chapter 18 and look at It's a slightly different complexion here. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Whew. As you know, birds are, in parables are evil. And here's, the, here's one of the many uh, underscores of that. Every unclean, hateful bird. Birds are used here idiomatically as ministers of Satan. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. And in this light, you should take a look at this letter to Thyatira of the seven letters, seven churches, which emphasizes many of these same things. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works in the cup which she hath filled. Fill, her, uh, fill to her double. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Strange remark. 
even, even in the language of, of, of visions here and so forth. I am no widow. It makes no sense until you study Israel and Babylon in contradistinction, because Israel is viewed in Hosea and elsewhere as widowed and divorced, as idiomatically. She's bragging she's not like Israel, you see, against this anti-Semitic antithesis here that's going to be reversed. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. For the king, now there are three groups of people we're going to encounter here that are really upset about this. The kings of the earth, who have committed fornication deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament for her. And when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment. That's a strange phrase. Makes her almost sound radioactive or something. Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. That's one group of people. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn for over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. The merchandise, and they're going to list 28 things here. Merchandise of gold, silver, precious stones, and of pearls, and of fine linen, and purple, and silk, and scarlet, and fine and wood, and uh, all the manner of vessels of ivory, and all manner of vessels of most precious wood, and uh, brass, and iron, and marble, and cinnamon, and odors, and ointments, and frankincense, and wine, and oil, and fine flour, and wheat, and beasts, and sheep, and horses, and chariots, and slaves, and souls of men. Twenty-eight. All kinds of people have tried to look at this list, categorize it. It doesn't lend itself to any obvious structure. And I think the reason is, I think it's deliberately put here so that we don't allegorize it. These are literal cargoes, literally traded by merchants. I think this is a, one of the Holy Spirit's moves to keep us from getting too metaphorical on this whole thing. And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all the things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find, no, in the, find them no more at all. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall st here again stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, the great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. See? For in one hour so great riches has come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and many as trade by sea I stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? Interesting, these three groups of kings, merchants, and those that trade by sea all stand afar off, shocked, upset by the quickness of this destruction. And they cast dust upon their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the, sea, in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour she is made desolate. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. Who's getting avenged here? The holy apostles and prophets. Wow. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it in the sea, saying, Th Thus with violence shall the great city of Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. The voice of the harpers, musicians, and pipers, and trumpeters shall be no, no more heard, uh, no, shall be heard no more at all in thee. No craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee, and the sound of the millstone shall, no more, uh, shall be heard no more in thee. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And here's an issue. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. What an interesting addition. For thy merchants were of great men of the earth, for by sorceries were all nations deceived, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. And remember the word sorcery is, in the Greek is pharmakia. It deals with uh, substance abuse. Mystery Babylon, the great whore. She rides the beast with seven heads and horns, mother of harlots and abominations, drunk with the blood of the saints. And, and that's 17. 18 describes Babylon the great as a city where the king's merchants and those that trade, the three groups of people. Now, it's interesting, mother of harlots, a little, I won't get into a whole long discussion on this one, but all occultic practices originate in, ba in Babylon. We could go through, we could spend uh, a week's worth of studies go, listing all these things. Um, it's astonishing what you can uh, concatenate that had its origins in Babylon. And the same stories that started in Babylon that get translated into all the myths of all the subsequent empires are echoes of the same narrative. Tammuz, who is the son of Nimrod, and his queen, the son of Nimrod and his queen, Simiramis, was identified with the Babylonian sun god. 
And they worshipped uh, the sun god by, at, at the winter solstice. As you know, it, it, roughly December 22nd on our calendar, the sun, the days get shortest. And they, they viewed that as a ceremonially as a sun dying and being reborn. And the way they celebrated Tammuz, they, they took that night a Yule log. The word, Cal, the, the word in Chaldean for infant is Yule. And they'd burn it in the fireplace. He dies. And then the next morning, he'd be replaced with a trim tree because he's resurrected. That whole idea of, uh, was always done about the winter solstice. Well, obviously, the Babylonian system gets translated ultimately to Rome, and the Roman practices get embodied in, uh, in, in Britain, too. And many of our Christi uh, Christmas traditions are from, well, let me back up. When Constantine takes over the, 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 the world, he does, he's, he's got a problem. He's got Christians that were slaves, but now represent more than 50% of the population, apparently, a large, large constituency. He has three different groups of sun worshipers under his reign. He's trying to unify his empire. So he makes Sunday a day of worship for all of them. OK, it makes sense, all right? Um, was he a Christian? He's, there all kinds of, uh, there's all kinds of uh, uh, dispute among scholars about that, but he doesn't get baptized until he's on his deathbed, so think about that. But the net of it is, it isn't Constantine, but the second one after him that makes Christianity, what Constantine did, he gave his edict of toleration, he made, he made Christianity legal. That was a big break. But by the time you get to the second successor after him, he makes it the state religion. Big mistake. Big mistake. And, uh, but then what any culture does, they try to adapt their practices with the, the, the politically correct labels. So Saturnalia, this big blast they had around the, the, the Tammuz legend, they now make Christmas. And uh, the mistletoe, the wassail bowl, all these things that we associate with Christmas really have their roots in Babylon. If you really want to get on a guilt trip, you need to read Jeremiah chapter 10 when, you, when your friends are decorating a Christmas tree. Because it deals, of course, not with the Christmas tree. It's dealing with the, 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 the worship of, the, uh, uh, of trees. But anyway, it's kind of fun to read that at Christmas time. It gets all your friends upset. Um, but uh, we could go on and on about all the things in our culture that have their roots in Babylon. Perhaps one of the most important to understand is the zodiac. The zodiac before Babylon was very different. You, you have to learn about it by learning the names of the stars in the Hebrew or, the Aram, or if you can't find that, in the Arabic. And it lays out the plan of God from the virgin birth to, to the line of the tribe of Judah. But in Babylon, it gets corrupted with Babylonian labels and, and most of what we know with our labels and, our, and the mythology that surrounds the zodiac as we know it comes out of Babylon. It's, uh, it had a different version earlier. Babylon worship of Ishtar. The, the, uh, the golden egg of Astarte, uh, the fertility rites of spring give us Easter and all that. Have you ever wondered why we have around Easter rabbits that lay eggs? Rabbits don't lay eggs. How did rabbits get mixed up with eggs? Well, it's, it's a, a commingling of different legends. Rabbits are, a, because of the, their multiplication, they, a symbol of new life. The egg is a symbol. Of, so these get commingled and, and uh, become the, leg, the pagan legends that still are, uh, occupy our culture. But see, the point is, this whole system out of Babylon gets transplanted. The, the, transplanted. the priests always follow the money. And when Babylon's conquered by the subsequent empires, their entire religious system is transplanted to Pergamus under the Persians and Rome under the Romans. And uh, so, and as Christianity gets established as the state religion of Rome, these traditions and practices and, uh, become uh, adapted, if you will, into the Christian uh, practices. Most of our cherished traditions are Babylonian in their roots. Well, again, we've gone through the destruction of Babylon, but I want you to, uh, 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 there's, there's something else I want to get at here. There are two views, then, about Babylon. There's the literal Babylon view that I generally have uh, presented to you. There's also the recognition by Dave Hunt and people of that, uh, that skill that there's also a very clear link to, to the Vatican at Rome. And many people assume you have to pick one or the other. It's interesting, I believe, both are true. I think Dave Hunt's book is a milestone that should be in every Christian's library, and you need to re really understand it. I also obviously hold to this literal Babylon view. How do you reconcile? Zechariah 5, I think, gives us the key to unlock this riddle. In Zechariah chapter 5, verse 5, Zechariah sees a strange vision. It says, Then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now thine eyes and see what 
is this that goeth forth. In the Bible, if you've read your Old Testament a lot, you'll notice every once in a while you get the strange phrase, lift up now your eyes. It's a key word, it's a trigger word of something really important. You'll always notice that pre what, what follows is usually a key milestone. Lift up thine eyes and see what this is that goeth forth. And I said, what is it? He said, this is an ephah that goeth forth. Now an ephah is a strange word in our vocabulary perhaps, but it, if you visualize it like a large jar about the size of an oil drum, about a full bushel, that was the standard commercial volumetric measure. You buy, we think of a bushel of wheat, they would think of an ephah of wheat. It's an ephah that goeth forth. He said, moreover, this is their resemblance through all the earth. Remember, this is a vision now he's seeing. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead. Now, a talent in the parlance here is, the, is a unit of weight. It's the standard commercial unit of weight. It's about 97 pounds. Call it 100 pounds to get a feeling for it. There's a lift up a talent of lead. This is the woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. So you got the strange picture here. This big jar, there's a woman in it, and this lead lid is going to seal her in there. Weird. Don't try this at home. Um, he said, this is, she, and by the way, the woman is labeled here for you. The, and he said, this is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the, the, it or the woman, into the midst of the ephah. And he cast the weight of the lead on the mouth thereof. So she's sealed. Wick, women representing wickedness is sealed in this ephah. Not finished. Then lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork. And they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heaven. Remember, this is a vision. Now, you also have to look at this through Jewish eyes. A stork is an unclean bird. So this whole thing has a, 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 a sinister complexion. And they carry this thing up in the middle of the earth. Then said I to the angel that talked with me, Whither do these bear the ephah? And the angel explains, and he said to me, To build it a house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. Now the word Shinar, or Shinar, however you want to pronounce it, is used in the Old Testament seven times. Each time it's used, in effect, as a synonym of Babylon. If Babylon is a city, Shinar is the county. Babylon is on the plain of Shinar. So when it says on the land of Shinar, that's Babylon again. To build it a house in the land of Shinar, it shall be established and set there upon her own base. This apparently was her original base. She's away from there. She is going to be gathered, sealed in this thing, and brought back to where it all started. I believe, my conjecture, that she represents the whore that's in Revelation 17, and that that power system is going to return back to where it started to receive the judgment that God has decreed. I think that's what Zechariah is saying. There's no further explanation. That's it. You're left to your own business. We have the woman called wickedness, sealed in the with a town of lead, carried by these two women with winds of historic between earth and heaven, to build a house in the land of Shinar, and she'll be established and set there upon her own base. Now, the, the, it's interesting, the book of Revelation has two women in contradistinction. There's Israel and the woman that rides the beast. They're different places. Israel is in chapter 12, is in heaven. The woman riding the beast is upon many waters. Israel is the mother of the man child. The, the riding beast is the mother of harlots. Israel is clothed with the sun in chapter 12. The uh, woman riding the beast is purple, scarlet, and gold. The, Israel is identified by the sun, moon, and stars, which is explained to you by Jacob himself in Genesis 37. The other one identity, she reigns over the kings of the earth. The enemy of Israel is the dragon. The enemy of the woman riding the beast is ultimately the ten kings. The Israel is hated by the world. The woman riding the beast is caressed by the world. Israel is sustained by the wings of heaven. The woman riding the beast is sustained by the dragon. Chapter nine, verse nine of chapter twelve. The one, uh, the, the, head, the, the headdress is different. Israel has a crown of twelve stars. Twelve, the Matzeroth, if you will. The woman riding the beast is the is mystery has mystery Babylon the Great on her on her. Uh, headdress. Israel is widowed and divorced. The woman riding the beast brags she's not a widow. The final location of Israel is in the New Jerusalem. The final case of the woman riding the beast is the habitation of demons. So that's a perspective. Let's take now a quick look at, okay, what's Babylon today? This is a picture of Babylon. 
In the right two-thirds of the picture is the ruins of Babylon that have been rebuilt. We'll look at that in a minute. I want This is a good picture because it gives you a synthetic mound that has been built slightly to the west that Saddam Hussein has had built and put his, his elaborate palace overlooking the ruins of Babylon. And uh, so this is a picture from a satellite. Um, it is about, uh, uh, it's about 55 miles south of Baghdad. Um, We'll take a look. Uh, there's, there's that mound, Saddam Hussein's palace. There's the ruins of the original Tower of Babel. Let's zero in on this mound and its associated ruins that we just looked at from a distance. Here is uh, the mound, and uh, there's the processional way that we saw originally. That's been found and excavated. And we'll zero in on this whole area a little closer. There is the palace of Nebuchadnezzar, parts of it that have been rebuilt. There's the processional way. There's the museum across the road. There we go. There is an uh, aerial photograph taken from a, a marine gun, gunship of uh, Babylon. Now it's the Saint's Palace. There's Babylon itself. There are shots of the, the ruins as we go around them. Obviously incomplete, but still, well, good start. There are some of the un, unrestored ruins. There is the, uh, the uh, uh, give you a feeling for the building. Notice the bricks there. We have one of those bricks up here on the podium. Uh, the old bricks have built by Nebuchadnezzar and so forth. The ones that, uh, the ones that, uh, there's one of the new ones that uh, Saddam Hussein has had his name as, as the successor having built it. These are some shots to give you a feeling of the ruins uh, of, the, uh, of the present Babylon if you were there today. There's the ship going around the palace. So Saddam had many of these elaborate palaces around the area. You can see all the military vehicles around there too. It, the whole place is sealed off, of course. For uh, There's some people getting a tour of the ruins themselves. The press makes light of this as just a, a novelty, but he spent a lot of money rebuilding this, so it's a start, but clearly, it demonstrates that the prophecies in the uh, Old Testament have yet to be fulfilled. So this city, this fabled city of the past, is going to be a major, major city in the future. And uh, we're going to see it more and more in the news as we go on, as there's parts of it still to be excavated and rebuilt. And uh, very, very impressive place. Okay, well, where is it going? Well, it's the most important city in Iraq, I suggest. The Shiites would like to make it their capital. They're agitating for that. There, my friend Tim LaHaye tells me that there's at least talk that the United Nations may move there. Now, it may surprise you to know that the United Nations is anxious to leave New York because they're too crowded. They've got to grow. There's no room. It's too, uh, they don't like being under the jurisdiction of the U.S. So the U.N. has their reasons for desiring a move. The New Yorkers, there are many powers in New York that would like them to get out of there. Uh, where would they move? They would not go to London or Paris or Berlin or something like that, of course, for lots of obvious reasons. There, but there is at least talk of moving to Babylon, which if they should do that would be, of course, <laughs> extremely provocative. Um, will it be the capital of Nim what I'll call Nimrod II, the Antichrist, when he surfaces, the final world dictator? I believe he will be. I think there's verses in Micah 5 and Isaiah 10 and elsewhere in that direction. But there's something else to watch that impacts all of this gives us a clue, and that's Turkey. Where's Turkey going? There's another major signpost for you and I on the near horizon. And uh, Turkey is trying to enter the European Union, has changed their alphabet, their language, spent 70 years changing their whole culture in the hopes of becoming part of the West. But they're now discovering that they're really not welcome. It's coming to a head this year. And uh, one of the things that we wonder, we, there are, uh, when I was at the Air War College recently as an invited civilian participant in the National Security Forum, I had an opportunity to talk to some of the Turkish three stars. And they're optimistic that they're going to be, ultimately be able to get into the European Union. When we were on Crete and, and on our Malta cruise and so forth, we had a chance to get a feeling for how Turkey is handling the issue of Cyprus. And they're doing some things that are very, can, really being applauded by Europe, doing the right thing. So there are some that are optimistic about them joining. There's, I have to say, I've in the past held skepticism that they'll join, but we'll see. Because if Turkey does not join the EU, if they're going to be spurned by the Europeans, that will cause them to shift their destiny to the east. Right now, Turkey is really run by the generals. They have 16 military assistance packs that, uh, with Israel, 
the, the trade bases, which gives Israel de facto control of the northern border of Syria. But if Turkey shifts to see their future with the Muslim East, that may change that whole picture. In fact, it may set the stage for what we call the Magog invasion of Ezekiel 38 and 39. And could this uh, whole thing be setting the stage for that? Possibly. Or the other alternative, suppose Turkey is admitted to the European Union. We'll know this year, I believe. Does that signal maybe a whole strategy? Europe's adding 10 countries and they're going to be and two more in 2007. Let's take a look at that. The dark blue on the screen is it existed before May 1st of 2004. A few days ago, they added 10 countries. The Balkans, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania that used to associate with the USSR. Then Central uh, uh, Europe, uh, Poland, Czech uh, Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary, and Slovenia. Scheduled for 2007 are Romania and Bulgaria. So that all seems pretty well underway, but the real enigma is what about Turkey? Turkey hopes to join. There are people that doubt it for a number of reasons. Turkey is the key between Europe and Asia. How it goes may trigger what the real manifest destiny is that's going to be emerging here. Now, there are several factors that are impacting all of this. The Europeans' deferral, this has been going on since 1987, off and on. And uh, that's been very discouraging to the Turkeys, to the Turkish uh, population. So that may open up the Turkic world of Central Asia, because Central Asia, meanwhile, is also mushrooming as independence. But the rise of Islamic fundamentalism in Turkey is a concern. Right now in, in Europe, there are somewhere between 13 and 15 million Muslims. But if Turkey joins the EU, they'll bring in 63 million more out of their population of 65 million. So it's a, uh, there, that, that's, that, that may be a cloud. We'll see. But the reason we watch this, we're going to watch this for several reasons. In terms of prophetic role, it's possible that Ezekiel 38 and 39 is on the near horizon. We know from Ezekiel 30, that 38 and 39 there's going to be an attempted invasion, armed and led by Russia, but that will involve a list of allies, all of which are in place except Turkey. Meshach and Tubal are cities in ancient Anatolia which, from which Turkey has emerged. So their role in Ezekiel 38 is very conspicuous. But they're presently pro-West, but we can easily anticipate maybe a refocusing towards the Islamic to get this whole area called the, the Magog invasion underway. As you know, if you've studied that passage, there's a people called Magog that we identify with the Scythians, which are the forebear of the true Russians. And all the tribal names that are there listed attempt to invade Israel. But this is famous for two reasons. It's famous because this is the occasion God uses to intervene on behalf of his people Israel. And also the passages in Ezekiel 39 appear to describe the use of nuclear weapons. And uh, the timing is a bit of a debate. Uh, if you know the 70th week, the seven-year period that is yet future, the middle of that week is, de is uh, 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 defined by the, an event called the abomination of desolation, the desecration of the temple. The week is defined, by the way, not by the temple being real, not, not by what a lot of people assume. It's defined by a covenant being enforced by a world leader for seven years. In the middle of that seven-year period, he violates that covenant, sets himself up to be worshipped right in the temple in Jerusalem. That's how we know the temple will be standing because uh, Jesus, Paul, and John all make reference to it standing at this time. So the temple will be rebuilt by then. We don't know when it will be rebuilt. Will it be before the 70th week starts, during the first half? We don't know, but we'll be standing by the middle of the week. The main point is that event triggers a time that Jesus himself labels as the Great Tribulation. It's not seven years, it's three and a half. It's the last half of that seven-year period. And, of course, it's climaxed with the Battle of Armageddon, which in turn is interrupted by the second coming of Jesus Christ and the setting up of his kingdom. So the debate is, okay, where does the Magog invasion take? There are excellent experts that believe it's part of the Armageddon scenario. Somehow it's part of that whole thing uh, it's summarized in Daniel 11. And Hal Lindsey, I'll use as an exa exemplar of the people who hold that view, he would to this day uh, argue that, that view. He and I have a, fr uh, a friendly agree. We have a, an agreement to disagree agreeably. Because uh, I happen to join some of those that have a different view. Grant Jeffries... Chuck Smith, myself, and some others. We suspect that the Magog invasion may not have anything to do with the 70th week. In fact, it may precede it. It may even set up the events for the 70th week. Now, the reason I bring this up is just to so you recognize there are good scholars on both sides of that, that view on the one hand, but something we all agree on is that the Magog invasion takes place after the rapture of the church. So if the Magog invasion is soon, then the rapture, rapture is even sooner. Or the way it's often characterized is that if you're driving down the streets of your hometown and the start, all the stores are starting to decorate for Christmas, you know that Thanksgiving's not far away. See, so it's a good analogy, I think.
In any case, this is the occasion that God intervenes on behalf of his people Israel, and it appears to describe nuclear weapons. Why do I say nuclear weapons? Well, because the leftover weapons will supply all the energy needs of Israel for seven years. Professionals are hired to clear the battlefield afterwards. The only place in the Bible I know where there's a cleanup passage. There's a lot of battles, both prophetic and historical. Nowhere they generally deal with the cleanup. This one emphasizes it. Professionals are hired to clear the battlefield. They wait seven months before entering, and then they take seven months to clean it. And what they find, they bury downwind, east of the Dead Sea. In fact, it goes on to say if somebody goes through there and sees something the professionals have missed, he doesn't touch it. He marks the location lets the professionals come and deal with it. And you guys that have been briefed on nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare know the drill. Very, very similar, very familiar stuff to all of us. So it, anyway, we think 38 and 39 does seem to be on our near horizon. All the allies are in position except one. That's Turkey. That's why you want to watch what's the destiny of Turkey for a couple of reasons. This is one of them. And we don't know the placement. That's another debate you can study on your own. But it's interesting, the Intelligence Digest, which has scooped the CIA twice in history, for over 60 years been very one of the high, most reliable sources of uh, corporate intelligence, uh, since been acquired by James, the, the, the prominent uh, publisher in Britain, uh, military publisher. Uh, the Intelligence Digest has gone on record. They believe the Kremlin has made the decision to make the invasion when they can set up the uh, positioning for it. So that's interesting. Well, once Turkey, it's another signpost. Will Turkey set the stage for the Magog invasion as a prelude to the final chapters? Maybe. Or will it trigger a, a, a strategic extension of Europe's ambitions in the Middle East? If Turkey does enter, the next acquisition would be Assyria, what we call Syria and uh, Iraq. Now, that's not on the near-term horizon. In our view, watch and see what happens to Turkey and then see, then watch your papers. If that does happen, you heard it here first. Okay, if this all is going on, what about the European Union? If Turkey does get admitted to the European Union, does that imply that this, their horizon will ultimately include Syria? Or will the Magog disaster, if it happens, leave a power vacuum for an emergent leader to come on the world stage? How would a preemptive nuclear strike in the Middle East impact this horizon. Saudi Arabia now has 120 CSS-2s, each with three nuclear warheads, operational. Can Israel sit by and leave them in place? They've always in the past preemptively taken out that kind of a threat. And there's talk that they will before the end of the year. We don't know. We'll see. But they've also, Israel's indicated, if they do take it out, they'll include Mecca and Damascus in, tar in their targeting. Now, there's an interesting passage in Ezekiel 39, verse 6, we want to pay attention to. God sends fire upon Magog. He wipes out this invasion. But he says, I will send fire on Magog and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Strange phrase. And among them that dwell carelessly in the isles. We have no idea who that is. The word isle or ia is, can be coastlands or remote. It's a remote. Every place else is used. It's a very remote island, pleasant place kind of thing. There are some people who conjecture on this that maybe it's our missiles that are used by God to put the hailstones of fire on Magog and his allies. And maybe the United States will get hits in return. Is it possible that a nuclear exchange could wipe out the US in terms of its military dominance at the moment? And could it also maybe wipe out Islam? If in this crossfire, Islam is wiped out and, and the United States is crippled, that leaves a power vacuum that the UN, the Europe, would jump into, and a leader might emerge with a plan to never let that happen again, et cetera. So that's one sh sh scenario. You can watch the papers and come to your own studies and conclusions. But I'll remind you of the challenge that I want you to carry away from this study. It isn't any of these details. It's a perception that I want you to challenge. Don't accept my word for it. You prove that this is wrong by your study that we are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in human history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountain Judea. That is a preposterous summary. Ridiculous. And yet, to challenge that, you've got to do two things. You've got to find out what the Bible really says about these days. That's not hard to do. It takes a little study. Find out what the Bible says, not what Chuck Missler or any, whoever your favorite commentators are. Find out yourself what the Bible says. The second thing you've got to do used to be difficult. It's not today, not with Internet and the resources that are now available. Find out what's going on. You won't on the 10 o'clock news. 
The more you know about your Bible and the more you know about what's really going on on the world scene, the more you'll get the sense that the stage is being set for the final climax of human history in our lifetimes, in the near term. Encourage you to check it out. It affects our priorities. It also creates a sense of urgency to accomplish what God is calling you to do. God has a purpose in your life and the great adventures to discover what it is. But all of these things that are going on around us should be galvanizing us into a set of priorities that affects everything we do. Everything should be impacted. Not by your church, not by religion, by the person of Jesus Christ, your relationship with him. Find out who he is and find out what his plan is for you. That's the challenge. God bless you.